Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, thank you for joining me uh, today. Uh, I'll just give you a brief uh, introduction to myself. Uh, my name is Alan. Uh, I'm the Commercial Director at Sovereign Trust Hong Kong Limited. Um, and today's session, uh, the topic is uh, the art of using trusts for entrepreneurs. So just before I begin, uh, what I'd like to do is to quickly go through some uh, house rules. Um, so this uh, session will be recorded uh, and for all those who have registered, you will receive a copy of the recording uh, and also a copy of the slides that I'll be using uh, in my presentation today. Okay, uh, this is going to be a, a pretty short uh, session. Uh, it's it's uh, informative and it'll provide a brief overview. Uh, so what I'll do, uh, I'll make sure that I leave uh, 10 minutes, at least 10 minutes at the end uh, for any questions and answers. Uh, however, uh, please feel free uh, to write down your questions that you have uh, and I will look at those uh, after the presentation during the questions and answers session. Okay, so uh, without uh, further ado, uh, I'll start the presentation. Um, so like I've mentioned, uh, I'm, uh, I'm from Sovereign Trust Hong Kong. Uh, we are a private uh, trust and corporate services uh, provider. Uh, so we actually began our operations uh, in 1987 in Gibraltar, uh, which is where our headquarters is still based. Uh, we manage over 20,000 structures, uh, mainly our clients, uh, both uh, private uh, individuals uh, and also corporates as well. Uh, we also provide uh, pension services, which mainly are more applicable uh, in from our Guernsey office. This timeline shows you, I suppose, it's, it's probably good uh, representation in numbers. Um, you know, 35 years uh, we've been around since 87, 34 licensed entities, uh, about 23 offices worldwide, uh, with over 400 uh, employees throughout the group. You can see in the top left-hand corner, uh, Hong Kong uh, was the uh, second office that was established within the group, uh, and since then, like I've mentioned, our core services are trust uh, corporate services uh, and also private wealth management. So what is a trust? I'm sure many, many of you, uh, those registered and uh, listening today at the presentation uh, will have uh, either been uh, advised about a trust uh, or certainly know slightly uh, about trusts. Uh, but how many have you actually been uh, told that trusts, especially from a corporate point of view, can actually help in your business as well. Uh, so in my experience uh, and from the uh, clients that I speak to, it, it's actually a very powerful tool. Um, and the rain, and I suppose the main highlight of this presentation is to really just to uh, bring about um, how trusts can also be used uh, in the corporate world um, rather than, you know, I, I think I think the misconception is is that uh, trusts traditionally uh, have been used as a as a wealth planning uh, estate planning tool uh, for private individuals, uh, but I just want to highlight how trusts uh, can also be used uh, in the uh, business environment uh, that you work in, uh, and how we can use those tools to help develop your business uh, successfully. So the first thing I wanted to do uh, in the presentation was to uh, highlight a case study. Uh, the company uh, that I'm looking at is uh, Tudo.com. Uh, I'm sure many of you uh, will have heard of uh, Tudo.com. Uh, more recently, it's actually um, it has actually uh, joined forces, shall we say, with the uh, with another uh, service provider uh, called Yuku. Uh, so now they're one of the largest. Uh, uh, I suppose video blogging service providers uh, in mainland China. Um, but in 2011, uh, Tudo uh, actually listed on the NASDAQ uh, back in August 2011. So, what well, that was what, approximately 11 years ago. Um, and at that time, based on uh, the shares that were sold, Tudo was actually valued at 822 million. Now, that would sound pretty good to, to, to a lot of you. Um, but, uh, you know, the forecasted valuation was actually uh, 1 billion um, if it had listed uh, slightly earlier, well, I say eight months earlier in December 2010. And really the main focus really is, is, is what I want to do is really focus on how trusts uh, may have prevented this uh, from happening. 
So just to give you a slight background, um, Gary Wang, as you can see um, on the right hand side, some of you will recognize him, uh, some of you not. Um, but what Gary did back in 2005 was he established uh, Tudo.com. So even in the very early stages, uh, Tudo.com was, uh, uh, I would say, so, sort of a, it's like a YouTube um, for mainland Chinese uh, in that part of the world. Um, the name Tudo.com simply means couch potato. Um, and what Gary said, what he wanted to do was to actually encourage people, uh, okay, from being, from stop being couch potatoes, really, uh, getting off uh, their seats, uh, blogging, uh, using the platform that Tudo.com uh, made available to them, uh, similar to YouTube. You know, you, you, you do clips, uh, you present clips uh, on social media, and this is where it's grown. I mean, today, uh, in its current format, uh, Tudo.com, it's probably, I would say, more commercialized. Uh, it offers uh, pay-per-view videos, um, new screen releases of films, uh, mainland Chinese series, etc. Even back in the early days in 2005, uh, it, it received uh, seed funding uh, from a number of venture capitalists. Uh, just to name a few, uh, there was GGV Capital, uh, Jafco Group Limited, um, and also International Data Group. Some of these names you may not or may not know, uh, but during in the early years when uh, Tudor.com was founded, um, it raised approximately 100,000 uh, US, uh, and then more latterly in 2005, 500,000, uh, but then the year after, that actually increased to 8.5 million. So a lot of uh, the investors especially saw a lot of potential uh, in Tudor.com, um, which actually led to uh, the proposed listing, uh, which um, it was planning to do back in 2010. Like I mentioned, uh, I suppose Yuku uh, was actually the larger of the two. So Yuku was the number one and Tudor.com was number two. Uh, offering similar services. So they both more or less plan to uh, list on the NASDAQ around the same time. However, uh, like I mentioned to you before, uh, Tudor didn't actually go ahead with the listing, but Yuku did. Um, and the reason for the delay in, in terms of Tudor.com um, really listing at a later stage was really because of um, the divorce uh, proceedings uh, that was taken against Gary by his ex-wife. So what you can see, and, and something I would clearly say is, you know, divorce is expensive. Um, and the valuation uh, was, well, Tudor.com was listed 20% less uh, than what it could have achieved. Now, one thing I do want to highlight is that um, there were other market conditions which affected um, the valuation of Tudor at that time. However, one thing's for sure as well, uh, the divorce uh, proceedings that were being taken against Gary at the time obviously didn't help. So it leads on to the final point is, how could a trust be used in this instance? Um, and the simple answer is, is if Gary had used a pre-IPO trust, uh, then he may have actually prevented this from happening and the valuation of Tudor.com would have probably been a more of a fairer reflection if it was, for, uh, if as forecasted, the valuation of the company was closer to the 1 billion as opposed to the 822 million. So, like I mentioned to you before, in, in, in my experience and, and working with a lot of uh, entrepreneurs uh, at Sovereign, um, those who want to start up their companies, etc., what we've noticed and what I've noticed uh, especially is that typically there's a business cycle. Okay, So these are the four stages that I believe represents um, when a company starts. Um, and really through the motion, if you look at this diagram uh, in, in a clockwise position, so for uh, a startup, we look at the start stage, the investment stage, and then when it expands, and ultimately leads to maturity as well. So stage one. So I'm using uh, I'm using a, a, a life a live case study. Uh, obviously, I've changed the name. So and I'm going to use the, uh, the name Eric. Okay, there's no reason why it just uh, popped in my head, and it seemed good appropriate at the time. So Eric um, started a fintech business, and uh, what he plans to do is that he's developed an algorithm, um, which, is, which the aim would be to help e-commerce business um, advertise their products on uh, e-commerce platforms such as Amazon, Zalora, etc. Um, 
what that technology does and what the algorithm does uh, is that let's say for example um, you're on Amazon uh, I mean we've all used Amazon um, or even Topo uh, to purchase items so what it will actually do uh, uh, those who have used Amazon there are a lot of third-party sellers and, and these are the clients Eric is actually targeting okay so what the algorithm does or what the technology does so, so let's say for example you go onto Amazon uh, you search for a product uh, let's say, for example, uh, it could be headsets, it could be a pair of trainers, etc. It could be a branded trainers. So let's say, for example, Nike. Uh, there's no affiliation. Um, so let's say, for example, someone goes on there looking for Nike. Uh, what Eric, the, the algorithm that he's developed is that if someone's actually searching for uh, trainers in, in that sense, what it will do, his algorithm will actually promote uh, his client, which is the third party seller on Amazon, and will actually promote his client's trainers as well. So whilst you're looking at uh, Nike trainers, et cetera, um, the third parties trainers will also pop up. So what that does to the consumer, what Eric has told me is that the consumer on that website will then potentially consider the third parties uh, trainers as well. So in essence, that's how, um, this is what Eric wants to do and that's his FinTech business, okay? Um, and in the next stage, what we'd see is really the seed and development stage. So similar to Tudor.com, most of these startups requires capital. So if Eric uh, was a wealthy individual, um, then he would probably be able to actually uh, fund his business uh, without any uh, capital or seed funding from venture capitals, uh, capital firms, uh, such as what's happened to Tudor.com. So this is the position that, uh, uh, sorry, this is the uh, the issue that uh, Eric would face. You know, how do I expand my business? How do I attract investments? Um, and you know, in order to do that, how how can I achieve all those goals? You know, because what Eric wanted to do ultimately was, besides growing the company internally, once it hit a certain threshold, uh, it would want to actually seek further investments. So this is similar to uh, Tudor.com uh, in 2011 listing on the Nasdaq. So at that seed and development stage, which could also be uh, in the expansion stage, is really he's actually preparing uh, a solution, okay, in terms of how we can attract further investments by listing. But in order to do that, he needs to uh, retain a number of key members of staff to be able to do so. So growth. This is ultimately the sort of the end game uh, that Eric is trying to look at. Uh, he's trying to increase the market share uh, by offering uh, his services. He needs to promote his services. And at this point, he's really looking for business expansion. <coughs> Pardon me. And in order to do that, he needs to um, seek investment. And what we can look at now is that how can you actually achieve that through uh, additional investment within the business? Once Eric has achieved uh, the growth, what usually happens is that we see the business mature. So what that basically means is at this point, Eric is now faced with a decision. Does he decide to reinvest? Or does he actually exit the, the business or the industry altogether? What he may want to do is actually leave a legacy for his, uh, his family. For example, his children uh, who, may want, who may or may not want to continue the business. Or perhaps, um, like I've mentioned, it's matured. Perhaps Eric just simply wants to exit, um, take what he's earned um, and really enjoy his life after all the years of of actually starting the business, he's now bearing the fruits and he can afford a comfortable retirement. But as you know, for most entrepreneurs, that's not really likely to happen. Um, and especially with Gary's uh, example, uh, Gary Wang of Tudor.com, after starting Tudor.com, he actually embarked on a animation company, uh, similar to the likes of uh, Pixar, DreamWorks, etc. cetera. Um, so he's creating a lot of uh, animations. Um, and I think that applies to a lot of the uh, entrepreneurs, especially those that I speak to. For them, earning uh, the amount of money that they do, that's not really the end game. The end game for them is that they are actually part of something. They developed a product, uh, they've innovated uh, a service that's actually useful, 
um, and for them it never stops. That's how entrepreneurs think. So I've sort of highlighted and touched upon, you know, um, and really going back to what the main topic is, is to really focus on how uh, trusts uh, can help in the business. And what I want to do here is to apply um, how we can apply trusts throughout the business cycle. So basically through start uh, to seeding, investment development, to uh, expansion, growth, and eventually to maturity. So during all stages um, of the business cycle, okay, trusts can be used, corporate trusts can be used throughout the life cycle. So no matter where you are, uh, especially for yourself, those in the audience who may be able to relate in terms of their uh, business ventures, um, you know, trusts can be used uh, throughout uh, the cycle. Okay, so in this case, a pre-IPO trust, I mentioned it earlier on uh, when looking at Gary Wang uh, of Tudor.com. So a pre-IPO trust, what is it? Okay, so what that essentially does is that it protects the investments or it protects the investors wanting to make an investment uh, in, in a business. So, and I put a couple of key points there, you know, investors do not want their investments harmed or diluted. So why I've mentioned that this would have been a potential solution for Gary at the outset, uh, prior to him um, listing Tudor.com on the NASDAQ, is that for an investor, when they actually see that um, Gary Wang's uh, marital affairs, what, you know, what typically happens in, in the divorce uh, proceedings is that the, the ex-wife, the ex-partner, they will make a claim against Gary, okay? Um, you know, I don't strictly know what the laws are in mainland China, but typically the assets uh, of Gary would have had to be shared with his uh, ex-wife or ex-partner. Uh, so as a result for a, a, an investor, the investor would be very, very concerned that um, the investment that they intend to make in a company, it's going to be diluted, okay? And what their concerns are, rather than having to deal with Gary as the founder, they may have to deal with uh, Mrs. Gary Wang, um, as well, and there may be potential issues going forwards. So how the pre-IPO trust would work is that Gary as the founder, the shares that he would have in Tudor.com, he would have actually placed those, or, or, or in technical terms, settled those assets, the shares that he had in Tudor.com, okay, into a pre-IPO trust. Because technically what the trust will do is actually ring fence that away from Gary's assets, okay? Like I've mentioned, this is all a brief overview. Uh, I'm happy to provide a further, more detailed explanation, but given the time, uh, this is just something, a brief overview uh, that some of you might find of interest. Also, the second, well, actually the most valuable asset uh, for an entrepreneur, especially in, in terms of Eric, uh, the live case study, and Gary, it's, it's the intellectual property. It's the, actually, it's the most valuable asset that you have there. So obviously, beyond the founder, him or herself, okay? So ultimately, if, let's look at Eric, the live case that, uh, that I'm actually currently working with at the moment. You know, it is the ultimate key to the success of the business. Without the IP, the algorithm, uh, it can't be developed. Uh, you can't sell it, you can't promote it, okay? So put it this way, if Eric uh, did not have the idea or concept um, of the intellectual property, the truth of the matter is that the business uh, that he wanted to embark on, it would probably have not even taken ground, simply because he does not have the idea or innovation. So from our perspective at Sovereign and myself, that's probably the first key thing that I would actually mention to, to clients. You know, you have to protect the assets, not only yourself uh, as the founder or the individual with the idea, you've also got to protect the intellectual property as well. So similarly to a pre pio trust, uh, the intellectual property trust, IP trust, can be used to ring fence the intellectual property. By ring fencing, uh, it could potentially uh, prevent any potential litigation uh, or certainly uh, someone challenging the IP as well. So, as I mentioned earlier on in terms of uh, the business cycle, uh, when you're looking to actually develop uh, your business, you're trying to grow, you're intending to, to expand, okay, the key things are you can't do it himself. You can't do it yourself. So Gary wasn't able to do uh, Startup Tudor or expand it himself. What he required was obviously key members of staff uh, that were able to help him, okay? 
everybody needs key members of staff. You know, Sovereign has them. Uh, I, I predict, dare I say, the enterprises that you're embarking on. You will have key partners uh, that will actually help you uh, innovate and develop your business ideas, especially for uh, IT. And Eric's example, he has a lot of programmers, etc., working on the algorithms, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. But one thing's of uh, one thing of importance to note is during the early stages of a startup company, etc. There may not be enough capital for you to actually uh, pay the salaries that these individuals want. But also, as I've mentioned to you before, a lot of these entrepreneurs, they want to be a part of something. So what better way uh, to actually um, allow people to have some sort of ownership uh, and to be part of something than, than providing them with shares? What we call there is that we could establish something what's known as a, it'll be a, a, like an employee uh, award scheme or you know, in more of a technical term, an offering that we do can provide is an employee benefit trust. And simply speaking, the employee benefit trust, depending on uh, what you, how you want to incentivize the, client, uh, the employees, uh, for example, shares, you may give them share options, and that will actually allow your staff, okay, to feel as if they are part of the business. And obviously, once it gets to the stage whereby the company has grown, matured, uh, then, the value of those shares will also increase as well. I mean, you've only got to look at the examples of the original founders of Apple, for example. Those, I, I can't remember the names, but the story, what this one story does stick out is that, you know, the founders, some of them did receive shares at the very beginning, but, you know, some of them sold them very early on. And those that actually held on to them have made a lot of money out of Apple stocks. So it's a fairly similar sort of scenario. It, you know, it, it sort of retains the staff and also gives them an incentive as well to work for the company. So finally, just really looking at the family trust. Um, this is more of the uh, traditional use of a trust, uh, which I've mentioned earlier on. So let's say, for example, uh, Gary uh, has decided, look, I want to exit the strategy. Uh, sorry, I, I, I want to leave the business. I think I've done enough. I've taken the company as far as I can. Okay. However, what about you know his children? Let's say, for example, his son. What if Eric? son wanted to actually carry on the business or Gary's future children wanted to actually carry on the business and the legacy itself. It can certainly do so, but whilst um, it protects the legacy, um, it will also protect the interests of uh, Gary as well, or even Eric, because what that means is that his shares uh, that he has within the company, okay, within his uh, startup business and his enterprise, he will actually retain that and the money that would receive, let's say, for example, in the form of a dividend, uh, would actually be paid up to the trust. Um, and that would also be part of the family planning. So should God forbid if anything happened to Gary or Eric, in my example, uh, then that could be passed on to the children. And as I've mentioned in the slide there, it allows for business continuance and it also uh, considers potential inheritance tax as well. Okay, so I'm nearly coming to the end uh, of the slides, uh, but just uh, one thing uh, I wanted to highlight was, like I mentioned, we've got a best, uh, we've got Eric, um, who is a, a live case study at the moment, and I just wanted to run through very briefly the proposed structure and the proposed solution that we've actually provided to Eric, uh, which after several discussions uh, between ourselves, legal advisors, tax advisors, etc. We've come across this structure, which may uh, or may not, uh, some of you may recognize or something that you may even want to consider, okay? So just very briefly, um, Eric has got two, two businesses. So he's got Funny R&D, they're not the actual name. So uh, for privacy purposes, I've actually uh, changed the name. So he's got a, a research and development department looking into the algorithm, okay? And he's also got a sales hub in China, where he's actually, like I've mentioned, he's trying to promote the uh, the business side of things uh, to third party sellers on, on Amazon, for example. Uh, what we've decided because of the structure when it first began uh, for Eric and his business partner, it wasn't actually formally um, structured. So he's actually sought our advice. So what we've decided to do is in the first instance, uh, by creating uh, the entities, uh, Funny R&D Limited, great sales holding company, what we suggest is that there would be a holding company called Money Keep Running Inc. Okay, like I said, it's not the real name, but it's simply a, a, a holding entity uh, for those uh, two underlying companies, Funny R&D and Great Sales Hold Co. Okay, 
So the next stage for us, uh, like I mentioned, similar to uh, Gary and what we think would be ideal because he is potentially looking to uh, list the company. Uh, we don't know where yet, but there is potential uh, in the near future. So as we can see, Eric's the founder. Uh, what we've done is decided to uh, decide to establish uh, a trust, the richest pre-IPO trust. That will maintain his interest. Uh, and as I mentioned, it will also uh, protect the interest of the investors who, as you can see, uh, they will intentionally hold about 25% of uh, the company. Thereafter, uh, like I've mentioned, we have the work hard scheme. This is like similar to the employee benefit trust, uh, an employee share award scheme that will help to incentivize and to retain key members of staff. And finally, uh, like I mentioned, the most valuable asset is the algorithm, okay? Um, so therefore, what we've done, what we've proposed, is that what we will do is that we'll set up a, a company, a highly protection hold co. It'll hold the IP rights, and above that, we'll have a high protection trust. What it does, it will ring fence the intellectual property away from the main assets of the company. Okay, uh, and the, the the actual IP can still be used by the great sales hold co. Um, as you can see with the loyalty agreement. So. What I want to do is that this is the solution that we provided for Eric. Um, it may or may not um, you know, uh, have similarities to what you or, or may be potentially thinking about, but this is the potential structure that we've actually uh, come up with uh, for Eric. Um, and then just finally, because uh, I know we're sort of running out of time, we've only got about four minutes, is that you know, I just want to highlight several things really, uh, but ultimately it's down to the fact that, look, Sovereign, we've been in this industry for quite a while. Uh, we've got over 35 years experience within the group, uh, not only through our legal counsel here in Hong Kong, but we've actually got legal counsel within the network, within the group uh, experience in this type of uh, work. So what I want to do is to highlight, look, Sovereign, we are a privately owned company, okay? Uh, we're a truly global entity and, and, and group. Uh, we are committed uh, to providing a, a tailored service uh, really to meet your needs uh, and requirements and not ours. Uh, we're not here to say, look, that example uh, that I've just given, the best solution for Eric will fit your, what you want to achieve. Uh, but what, well, um, what we can do is really have a sit down um, because we're solution driven to provide you the best results for what you want uh, in terms of your business. Um, and yeah, I think I'd like to wrap her up there. Uh, I've, I've sort of overrun, uh, so apologies for that. Uh, what I'll do, I'll, I'll, I'll open the uh, chair now. Uh, I'll open it as if, uh, for any potential questions and answers that you may have. Uh, and yeah, please feel free to uh, drop some questions into um, onto the platform. Right, um, so one of the questions that's come up, uh, so how can we help uh, and also the costs and timeframes? Look, like I mentioned, we don't have a uh, tailored uh, fit or, or solution. Um, we don't expect uh, for clients to come to us and say, look, uh, Alan, uh, we need some help. What can you suggest? Um, we're not going to say, look, uh, this is what we've done for client A, client B, client C. Uh, we're certainly, you know, we're certain that it's going to work for you. It's not the case at all. Um, so. Without being too cryptic, it's very difficult uh, until we actually sit down, uh, learn more about your business, uh, how we can help. Uh, and, you know, one thing that I have learned is that, look, I'm not here to waste your time. Um, if it's something that we generally can't help you with, we'll, we'll certainly tell you. Uh, but obviously, it's something that we can actually work in conjunction together. Um, then we'll certainly uh, come up with a solution for you. OK, so so thank you for that. Um, just trying to see. Uh, Right, I think uh, you guys are, are either very, very shy, um, or I may have covered uh, all the points that you uh, attended to listen to. Um, but obviously, look, I'm going to leave my contact details at the end. Um, I know it's a Friday, um, so I'm not going to keep you any further. Uh, like I've mentioned, uh, those who have registered for today will get a copy of the slides and the recordings. Uh, and at the end, you'll have my contact details. Uh, so please do feel free uh, to contact me directly if you have any further questions. Like I've said, I've tried to provide a brief overview um, and it can get a bit technical, but look, it's a Friday. Um, I don't want to bore you to death. Um, and I'll say it's uh, what 4.30, uh, 
so yeah, please enjoy the rest of uh, the Friday afternoon. Happy hour is about to start, if it's not hasn't started already, uh, and have a good weekend. And thank you for your attending my presentation. Thank you very much.